I'm Angela. I'm an archaeologist and um, I work in Melbourne. Part of my job is to assess the sites um, before development to see whether there's any potential for cultural heritage. Back in 2013, when I found out that um, the Bukit Brown Cemetery was going to be partially um, destroyed to make way for the new road, mm-hmm. I approached um, Dr. Hui, Hui Yu Fong, um, to um, be involved in the project and to also get a chance to document um, the graves before they're removed. That's where I came in to do all the documentation of the below ground artifacts and also just the graves in general. The, the project started in, in November 2011. Uh, and, and from the start, uh, it was very interesting. It was never purely just a, a research project. At the time, Singapore Heritage Society helped us a lot. So they sort of like, sent out a clearing call to um, through their mailing list and to, to ask if anyone would like to help. We had like hundreds of people sign up um, through a Google form. I was very grateful to you know the um, people who came forward. There, there were um, people who were not even Chinese, right? So there were Malays and, and Indians who volunteered. There were even uh, for, foreigners who volunteered. And this showed me how, you know, this concern with Bukit Brown is not just a ch- Chinese heritage thing, right? But rather a uh, heritage for Singapore or even um, part of um, the world's heritage. The belief is that uh, the tombstone itself is a kind of portal mm. and uh, you know so the soul can sort of like travel mm. and if you exhume the person you crack the stone to sort of almost inform them that you know this is not your tomb anymore mm-hmm. you've moved house yeah. whether it's a reburial to another cemetery or to a columbarium okay this is a really interesting tomb you see the the first shoulder has the peacocks Right, and then this in front of the shoulder are the dragons, and then again the phoenix. So all the mythical creatures are here, right? It's really, really nice. But interestingly, so it's a couple. So the man is here, his name is here, his date of birth, right? And then his date of death. But you notice, of course, the wife has the date of birth, but no date of death and no photo. So she's not buried here. Either she's not buried here for whatever reasons, or maybe by the time she passed away, the cemetery had closed and therefore she's not buried here. So uh, basically we are now at Hill Tree, uh, it's the largest of the five hills of Bukit Brown and uh, the highest point uh, here, uh, Hill 130. The Imperial Japanese Army, IJA, were coming down right from the, uh, the Sime Road side because the highest point of Bukit Brown is on the top of Hill Tree. So the, the Japanese Army could see, were well, trying to monitor the British retreat because remember during the war, it wasn't forested like this so they could see and they're trying to monitor the retreat. So the British are on the other side and the Japanese army are coming down here. So these would be the shrapnel marks from the British uh, artillery. Yeah. So these are the actual pock marks. Uh, I think there were a few more, but uh, some of the tombs have been cleaned up or repaired.
for most of the items we see, there are specific items for the afterlife. So they 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 contain some ritualistic meaning. So things like the yeah the miniature pots, things like um, hairpins, um, kind of like jewelry that was silver that was meant for the afterlife. She one one of the most poignant artifacts that I came across was actually a wallet and a comb. When I saw the headstone, it's actually quite a young guy. It was like a someone in his mid to late teens, so it was still quite young. And I found out、um, that this guy actually died in an accident. There wasn't any other items. It was just I think it was just a wallet and the comb and some like just personal effects. Anyway, it was like some、um, like you know how they used to do the、uh, um, hair cream. So it's just so poignant that it was this teenager that lost his life suddenly in a, some、uh, accident, and they buried him with his personal effects, and that he still. You no, know, wanted to look good. So it was more that the daily items that he used, rather than something that you know that was all a ritualistic kind of、uh, items that were accompanying him to the afterlife. So even graves from the Second World War, that was on the top of the hill near Lonny Road,、um, that was the whole section that was unmarked. So those graves, a lot of them, we found baby items and children's items. So we know that、um, hospitals were sending、um, their dead there in. And buried them in mass graves. So a lot of those mass graves, we find children's dummies, pacifiers,、um, things like、um, glass milk bottles. So they, in those days, they use glass. So things like that, you know, that it's just some daily items that they use, that are not ritualistic items that that they really did send this individual into the afterlife with. 我们在世的东西有在啊，像厨房用具啊，是这种，全部陪葬的。那些镜子、电什么都有、啊。嗯。为什么要有？哎呀，人家有，我们也要有的，只是意义在哪里？没有意思嘛。所以这些只是习俗，不算是宗教的。不是。不是道教的。哦。啊，为什么他们好像他的骨头火化了，要放在那个坑里面？为什么要放放那个呃？那个钱、嗯，啊，就是说他脚大黄金。I mean, to me, what those things mean is the kind of care that were given to to the disease.、嗯 uh, that you you worry about whether they have enough, right? Whether they have the necessities of life in the nether world, right?、嗯、And so therefore, you you took the care to make sure that you have these things buried with them as well. Right, and and so so we were we were very、uh, fascinated with all these little details.、Uh, we we did notice、um, a, a difference in in、uh, different eras because like the earlier ones would be just earthen, and、yeah. then、uh, the the later ones would、uh, some would be glazed. I'm Jack, and I'm an assistant professor in history and religious studies at NUS. I think, in general, Buddhists、uh, see death as a, you know a part of the life cycle. So,、um, most Buddhists don't really put that much emphasis on death per se. But of course, because of you know Chinese kind of culture,、uh, belief, and practices,、uh, we Chinese tend to see death as a very important kind of a part of you know the, the kind of the end of the life where they have to celebrate, you know, or in other words, have to、uh, conduct rituals to send off the soul and so on. Hi, I'm Stella Claire Wee, and I'm the、uh, granddaughter of the late Mr. Ong Eng Wee. Uh, who was buried at Sime Road, which is part of the Bukit Brown complex? I think the site is very special to us because,、um, other than my maternal grandfather, I believe his parents, his siblings, and、uh, some of our other、uh, family family from the Ong clan are actually buried at Bukit Brown. Always remembered going to his grave site since I was in kindergarten,、uh, tagging along. And I think there's always preparation involved when my mum was still a Taoist. So the day before she would start cooking、um, some of the dishes, she would pack it up in a tiffin carrier. She would also prepare by buying all the、uh, joss paper. She would buy some of the、um, you know joss stick, joss paper. She'd get matches ready. She'd buy fruit. You know, a whole bunch of、uh, all the rituals associated with、uh, visiting the tomb at Qingming. She would get it all ready. Um, including a hot thermal flask of Chinese tea as well, and、um, she'd pack it all up, and then by seven or eight o'clock in the morning, we'd all be like 
on standby waiting for her to sort of bark orders at us and then my dad would drive us over to Bukit Brown. And even after we'd become um, Christians, um, my parents would still visit his grave during Qingming. But instead of preparing all the um, food, uh, bringing Joss paper, um, they would actually buy a bunch of flowers and out of respect they'll just uh, drop it, uh, not drop it, but they'll just leave it on his uh, tomb. Yeah, we, we did that for quite a number of years. I think they carried on doing that when I was overseas. And when we came back, I think I followed them a couple of times and then, yeah, I, I guess when they passed on also that whole practice just stopped. We, we've seen like families that come for uh, Qingming or for the exhumation. And then like some of them are not Taoists or Buddhists, um, yeah. maybe Christians, but they, they, they also join in um, Perhaps they may not perform the exact ritual, but they, they pay their respect in their own way. Okay. Right? So, so you see that the space sort of brings the family together and, and regardless of their religious beliefs, they understand and, uh, that you know, they are there to pay respect to, to, the, um, to the forebears. And they are also there to um, celebrate um, the family. It is a space for a living because the relationship that they have uh, with the cemetery, with yeah. the grave, uh, with the ancestors, even though disease was a, is a, is a living relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a living relationship that you know, it goes vertically up, but then also connects horizontally.你是这边长大的都没有来了那你没有传给其他的年轻人？我们没有看，没有人看的。哎呀，这样很可惜呀。嗯。Hi, I'm Terence Ping. I am a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Liverpool. My work looks at the intersections of ethnic identity as well as sacred space amongst Chinese religion practitioners in Singapore. Many of the encounters, the meaningful encounters, I must say, that, that I had was, were with the families that engaged in these exhumation rituals. One particular one which I have talked about in a paper about a family who, whose father had died in Singapore when he was quite a young man, about 26 years old. The mother and her children moved back to China to, to continue their life. So when the mother died, and the sons found out that the father's grave was affected by the highway. They made their way back from China to Singapore to get the remains so they could reunite their father's remains with their mother's remains uh, in one place. And what I felt in that sense was this very meaningful connection that they, you know, that they, they still attributed meaning to all of it. Uh, it reminds me of what some scholars have said about that, that China is always home to many diasporic Chinese individuals especially those from the 1930s and 40s who were sojourners, who uh, saw China as the eventual place of their uh, eventual resting place uh, and not Southeast Asia. It was more the, um, the, the connections with people that you, you build up. Um, it's, that's why I say it's not just a, a research project or just a documentation project. Uh, it is a, a very unique project where knowledge is very much intertwined with um, what it means to be human. So in one case, uh, this old lady that was so happy to, to, to find um, the kin's 
grave that she she started to hug me and and thank me. So it's like I'm just doing my job, right? <laughs> I mean, at most you can say that I'm just doing a very minor favor, but to them, um, they are very grateful, and and that gratefulness sort of really gets to you. I I think. Digitization is almost a kind of revolution. It really democratizes history. Almost anyone can assess historical materials. Yeah. And once you you record it digitally, it means then that you can uh, put in put put the information, the data on a number of platforms, right? Toying with the concept that you know nowadays we should be talking about citizen historians, mm. right? Anyone who feels that they are part of Singapore, right? They are Singapore citizen and interested in Singapore history. Um, through the resources available through digitization, they can begin to write about Singapore's history. I think digital objects can be very meaningful, and like any social thing, depends on the way people attribute meaning to the objects. When it comes to something like Bukit Brown, I think it's really important that where we cannot hold on to the physical object due to deterioration or degradation. Some form of digitization has to take place, although it would be really nice if the object was not just photographed but rendered in a way it could be rotated. For visualization and digitization to be successful, I suspect there needs to be some kind of tactility. There needs to be some kind of experimentalism, some kind of ability to manipulate. And gives the viewer agency to see it the way they want to see it. That will make the object more meaningful. It's so significant, you see. Like this collection of grave items we have, a lot of them is not the same rituals we follow anymore. So it's a piece of a history because the artifacts themselves is that tangible link to the individual, or like you know, it's a link to their descendants.